Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in to our latest Science AAAS webinar, Deciphering Fibrosis, Exploring the Biological Drivers of Fibrotic Disease in Liver and Heart. I'm Sean Sanders, Senior Editor for Custom Publishing at Science, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. Fibrotic diseases of the heart and liver impact a significant proportion of the global population and are a growing public health concern. Myocardial fibrosis is associated with nearly all forms of heart disease, and the pathological changes seen include cardiomyocyte hypertrophy, chamber dilation, heart valve stiffening, and others, all of which contribute to heart failure. Non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH, is a fatty liver disease characterized by hepatocyte inflammation that contributes to fibrosis, cirrhosis, and liver failure. NASH is closely linked to obesity and diabetes. Changes in diet have thus contributed to its expansion and impact across the globe. Understanding the underlying biology of fibrosis is critical for the diagnosis, treatment, and management of cardiac fibrosis, NASH, and other fibrotic diseases. It's my pleasure to have two exceptional speakers with us today to discuss both myocardial fibrosis and NASH. They are Dr. Scott Friedman from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and Dr. Douglas Vaughan from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. Thank you both so much for joining me on the line today. Before we get started, I have some important information for our online viewers. You'll find photographs of today's speakers in the Presenters tab at the top right of the screen. Just click on the View Bio link to read more details about their background and research. To the right, you'll also see the Resources tab, where you can find additional information about technologies related to today's discussion, as well as a PDF of the slides. After the speaker presentations, we will have a short Q&A session, during which we will address some of the questions submitted by our live online viewers. So if you're joining us live, start thinking about some questions now and submit them at any time by clicking the Ask Question tab, also on the right, <clears throat> typing the question into the message box and then clicking OK. You can also log into your Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn accounts during the webinar to post updates or send tweets about the event. Just click the relevant icon at the bottom left under the slide viewer. For tweets, you can also add the hashtag hash science webinar. Finally, thank you to Cell Signaling Technology for sponsoring today's webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Scott Friedman. Dr. Friedman is the Dean for Therapeutic Discovery and Chief of the Division of Liver Diseases at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. He has performed pioneering research into the underlying causes of scarring or fibrosis associated with chronic liver disease an affliction that affects millions worldwide. His work has spawned an entire field that is now realizing its translational and therapeutic potential with new antifibrotic therapies for liver disease reaching clinical trials. Thank you so much for joining the webinar today, Dr. Friedman. My pleasure, Sean, and I'm delighted to chat with your webinar audience. Um, this is a very challenging problem that has some uh, interesting underlying biology and uh, new opportunities for therapies. Um, I have multiple relationships with companies uh, related mostly to fibrosis and NASH. I will not be discussing any specific drugs today, however. It's important to recognize that scarring of tissues broadly is a major problem for which there are very few approved drugs. Uh, scarring of lung, liver, kidney, heart, and other tissues, as you'll hear about from Dr. Vaughn for heart, uh, account for up to 45% of all deaths in industrialized nations. And uh, with few options therapeutically, there is an urgent need for scientific progress. And as I mentioned, many organs are affected by fibrosis. This is an overview from a New England Journal review by Don Rocky, uh, illustrating that scarring of tissues associated with injury to each of these individual sites accounts for a broad array of diseases that in encompass uh, skin, heart, liver, lung, pancreas, kidney, and frankly, uh, almost all tissues that respond to injury with a scarring response. Among most of those tissues, uh, the cascade is initiated by injury to epithelium. Now, interestingly, cardiac fibrosis is an exception to that rule, but for the three organs you see at the bottom of this slide, the lung, the kidney, and the liver, uh, injury typically starts by uh, 
insulting an epithelial cell. That leads to activation of resonant fibroblasts, which I'll be illustrating in liver in a bit uh, more detail. Uh, scar becomes laid down, and uh, the tissue reaches a critical point at which either healing may occur or progressive fibrosis can ensue. And while scarring of the lung, kidney, and liver uh, all can have catastrophic consequences, the time course and context in which these conditions occur are quite different. Uh, in lung, fibrosis is a catastrophic disease within three to five years with very high mortality. And at the other end of the spectrum, liver fibrosis is a more indolent condition typically that takes decades to evolve. I'll be focusing on liver for the remainder of my talk and point out that this scarring response in liver is really a common pathway among the many etiologies that uh, we clinical specialists or hepatologists see in practice. The big three in terms of etiologies are viral hepatitis, typically hepatitis B or C, alcohol and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. But in addition, there are other conditions that are listed here that can also converge on this fibrotic response and lead to end-stage scarring and possibly the need for liver transplant. As I mentioned, and as Sean alluded to, NASH is really the biggest uh, rising health threat, at least in the United States and Western Europe, and frankly around the world, um, associated with the widespread prevalence of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. NASH is actually part of a spectrum that collectively is an umbrella term known as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this can include plain fat in the liver, shown here, or progression to an inflammatory fibrotic condition known as steatohepatitis or NASH. NASH, over time, in many cases, will progress to cirrhosis. And of considerable concern once cirrhosis is developed is the uh, heightened risk of hepatocellular carcinoma or primary liver cancer. Most clinical trials, virtually all clinical trials that are addressing NASH, focus on the steatohepatitis stage uh, and not on steatosis alone. One other critical point to emphasize is that unlike other diseases, there's a reasonably high fraction of patients who develop hepatocellular carcinoma with NASH who are not yet cirrhotic, far higher than for, let's say, hepatitis C. And so we need to raise our level of vigilance for emerging hepatocellular carcinoma in any patient with NASH who has moderate to more advanced fibrosis even before they're cirrhotic. Uh, this map depicts the obesity trends in the United States, which is probably familiar to many of uh, your audience, showing the intense uh, uh, prevalence of uh, obesity. And associated with that, as I mentioned, is a rising prevalence of fatty liver disease, which is projected to rise exponentially over the next few decades. Currently, it's estimated that 65 million Americans already have one form of fatty liver disease uh, or another that will rise in the next 15 years or so to 100 million. Of this 65 million, at least 16 and a half million now have NASH. This is the condition which really merits attention and possibly treatment or enrollment in clinical trials, and this will rise to 27 million by 2030. And I also emphasize the importance of vigilance for hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC, which is projected to rise precipitously as well over the next decade and a half. I alluded to the fact that whereas NAFLD is a, uh, a condition that of, uh, of itself is not necessarily associated with progression to cirrhosis as shown here, whereas NASH, meaning once there's an inflammatory or fibrotic state, the progression rate to cirrhosis, while not clearly clarified yet, is certainly much faster than, than if there is fat alone. So once the uh, diagnosis of NASH is made, especially if there's any element of scarring, this really connotes a potentially high risk of progression and the need for monitoring and possible treatment as they emerge. Of all the different components of the histology of NASH, which include ballooning or a specialized kind of cell death of hepatocytes, uh, lobular inflammation and cell injury, uh, as well as fat, the, the most important predictor of outcomes is neither of those, but rather the fibrosis stage. What you're looking at here is a paper from several years ago by Zoberi Anasi and his colleagues, Zach Goodman and others, that looked at the natural out history or outcomes of patients who were diagnosed with NAFLD over a 300-month period based on their presenting stage of fibrosis. 
And what's clear from the solid line that travels down the, the uh, chart is patients who began this observation period with a fi- na- NAFLD activity score fibrosis stage of four, which is cirrhosis, had a much poorer outcome. And so increasingly, clinical trials are focusing directly or indirectly on the ability of a drug to ultimately reduce the progression of scar or fibrosis and to prevent the development of cirrhosis. I also mentioned and want to again underscore the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in this fibrotic disease. And as you can see from this recent review by Zoberi Yonasi, uh, NASH is the fastest growing cause of hepatocellular carcinoma among liver diseases. In absolute numbers, it's nowhere near as uh, uh, precipitous a cause as viral hepatitis. Nonetheless, in terms of the rate of rise over the uh, recent years, NASH is rising much faster than other etiologies. Uh, We in my laboratory have tried to develop a model for mimicking NASH in animals so that we can have a platform or a template to test uh, antifibrotic and um, anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, That was reported in Journal of Hepatology last year, so this is just a simple illustration. The model includes high fat, high cholesterol, and a high fructose diet, which are all elements of human NASH. But in addition, we give weekly carbon tetrachloride, a known hepatotoxin, And together, this combination of dietary and toxic injury leads to a marked increase in the number of liver cancers, as you can see in the fourth fourth bar in each of the two uh, data sets, as well as evidence of, uh, in the right-hand diagram or right-hand image, evidence of an interface between the fatty liver and carcinoma. In addition, we and others who try to develop animal models uh, want to gather as much data as possible to validate its resemblance to human disease. These are data from that same paper, just simply illustrating that when we do uh, transcriptomic arrays, the gene expression patterns, as shown here in the red box, closely resemble human disease, which is the bar to the left in bright orange. And so uh, we, among others, are using this model, but uh, there are other models as well. The key point is that we need to have robust models of disease if we're going to identify therapies that have a high predictive uh, or a high likelihood of translating into effective human therapies. Now let me shift gears just a little bit and zero in on the concepts around fibrosis and illustrate a a dichotomous uh, organization in which one can think about regulatory pathways in liver fibrosis as either being a core pathway or regulatory. This is based on a Um, an editorial that colleagues and I wrote several years ago. And we conceived uh, of core pathways as those pathways that are shared among other tissues and species. We presume that they have an earlier evolutionary role and uh, therefore also essential for fibrosis. Whereas what we call regulatory pathways or perhaps tissue-specific pathways also affect fibrosis, but their importance and their contributions may vary between species and tissues. So let me give you an example in liver what that looks like. Uh, We, uh, in a separate review, identified potential core pathways that you see listed here that include important growth factors like TGF-beta, connected tissue growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, VEGF, and others. And these would be conserved across many tissues, whereas if we looked at some of the disease-specific pathways for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, alcoholic liver disease, and NASH, they all uh, highlight features that are unique to that specific etiologies. And collectively, there are presumably both core pathways and disease-specific pathways that converge on the uh, fibrogenic mechanisms that I'll review just in just a minute. Now, if we return to NASH, it's important that to recognize that in one important way, it's quite distinct from viral hepatitis because this is part of a systemic syndrome. And so more than in other kinds of liver injury that lead to fibrosis, there are systemic inputs that converge on the liver to drive fibrosis or to attenuate its development. Those signals can emerge from the adipose uh, that are shown here, and this is from a review uh, written with my colleague Youngmin Lee uh, three years ago or almost four years ago now. Um, So the adipose-derived signals include TNF-alpha, IL-6, and adipokines. There's also signals that come from the gut in the form of the microbiome, as well as altered uh, permeability or enhanced permeability through a so-called leaky gut. Uh, Personally, I believe this is an extremely important driver of uh, liver injury, NASH, and fibrosis, and uh, is something that obviously is a complicated um, 
uh, pathway or series of pathways to disentangle, but in some ways could explain better than others why this epidemic of obesity and NASH has appeared uh, in our populations over the last 20 to 30 years, even though the genetic background hasn't changed uh, for thousands of years or longer. An additional tissue that contributes is the muscle, uh, particularly in the form of uh, contributing to metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. And these are all considered pro-fibrotic drivers from other tissues. And in addition, uh, there are um, antifibrotic signals that also come from the gut in the form of bile acids and signaling molecules that you see listed here. And so again, we're still trying to disentangle the relative importance of each of these drivers or uh, antagonists to fibrosis. And in particular, as I said, I think the gut microbiome holds uh, an enormous amount of information that will need to be unearthed in order to uh, understand better the pathogenesis of NASH in particular. Now, if we want to know more about the fibrosis that occurs in liver, that's illustrated in this diagram and this pair of diagrams here. My own work has focused since the mid-1980s on a resident cell type shown on the left-hand side in normal liver known as the hepatic stellate cell. And we and others have identified that the hepatic stellate cell undergoes a very characteristic response to injury, whether acute or chronic, in which, as shown on the right-hand side, these cells become so-called activated. They replicate. They're associated with the accumulation of extracellular matrix or SCAR that fills this subendothelial space between hepatocytes and endothelial cells and leads to dysregulation or dysfunction of surrounding cells that may ultimately translate into the clinical features of cirrhosis that we recognize as a rising prothrombin time, imp lowered albumin, impaired capacity to metabolize drugs. And this may all come about in part because SCAR is beginning to surround the hepatocyte or epithelial element that leads to liver dysfunction. Now, from this initial observation, we and others in the field have begun to piece together a fairly comprehensive and robust model of how stellate cells respond to injury. As I noted previously, it typically starts with injury to epithelium. For most cases of, uh, of parenchymal liver disease, that's the hepatocyte. But in addition, biliary epithelium can be injured in a specialized set of diseases. And either way, these lead to injury signals that ultimately activate the stellate cell and render it responsive to a whole host of other signals or growth factors in a series of pathways we refer to as perpetuation. And so that can include signals that drive cell proliferation, cell contractility, cellular fibrogenesis, altered matrix degradation, directed migration or chemotaxis, and inflammatory signaling. And I like to think about this as a conspiracy to make SCAR, so that everything that the stellate cell does is in essence or orchestrating a scarring response. But the liver also has ways to regress scar, perhaps more than almost any other organ. And recent studies have uncovered important pathways for scar uh, resorption through either reversion of activated stellate cells back to an inactivated state or through programmed cell death. So in a sense, when injury stops, the activated stellate cell can either revert or undergo de cell death to prevent the continued accumulation of scar. So continued scar formation requires continued injury. Now, moreover, in the ensuing years, and dozens and dozens of papers have identified many signals both on the cell surface and within the cells and the nucleus that all can drive stellate cell activation. And so identifying which of these different signals shown here are most important has been elusive uh, and may differ in different diseases. But nonetheless, these all represent potential therapeutic targets. Another way to envision therapeutic targets in NASH is illustrated by this slide, uh, in which we can think about the disease beginning with a fatty hepatocyte uh, and a number of signals converging on the cell type to drive activation of stellate cells. These signals can include changes in uh, lipids or fatty acids that you see listed here, uh, inflammatory signaling both that, uh, that injures hepatocytes but can also directly activate stellate cells, in addition, there are important signals once the hepatocyte or liver cell is injured and steatotic uh, that can emerge from these injured hepatocytes that further drive stellate cell activation, and these are listed, as you can see, on the lower left-hand side. And finally, there are a growing list of changes that occur within stellate cells that also represent a more direct approach to attenuating fibrosis through altering of epigenetic uh, events as well as some of the signaling pathways you see here that I don't have time to review in detail.
What's remarkable, however, is that the liver has an enormous capacity to resorb scar. Uh, and this is just one paper actually now, in, now published some years ago uh, by Patrick Marcian and others that show that uh, if patients with hepatitis B are effectively treated with the drug tenofovir, there's a remarkable regression of fibrosis. So if you look in the baseline state, 38 percent of patients had cirrhosis. Five years after successful chronic hepatitis B therapy, now only 12 percent of patients, according to this scoring system, still have cirrhosis. So it speaks to the unusual and extraordinary regenerative capacity of the liver to not only reconstitute epithelial function, but also to degrade existing scar through mechanisms that we're only beginning to understand now. Um, some of those mechanisms are illustrated here. For, in, for the sake of time, I'll go over this very briefly. Uh, we know that there is activation of stellate cells that can undergo apoptosis. Um, we know that many signals from particularly inflammatory cells, such as macrophages and NK cells, can also contribute to apoptosis as well as degradation of scar, and that's shown here. The, the exact and most important sources of proteases that degrade existing scar has been very elusive in liver. Current evidence most strongly implicates the cell type you see on the upper left-hand side, the so-called LY6C low hepatic macrophages, at least that's a mouse nomenclature. Uh, but we're still struggling to prove conclusively which cell types make the proteases that are critical for degrading existing scar when liver injury and fibrosis regresses. And finally, if we come back to the uh, emerging targets that are currently in or conceived for therapeutic trials, it's built on the same template that I showed you previously, in which a, a growing list of signals can inhibit fat accumulation, shown here. They can also improve the insulin resistance that may have a secondary benefit also through weight loss uh, on the fibrotic response. Uh, there are a whole host of inflammatory targets that are listed here as well as uh, signals that are intended to, uh, to uh, improve the health of mitochondria and to reduce oxidant stress in these injured hepatocytes. And finally, signals that are antifibrotic directly by impinging on the hepatic stellate cell's capacity to activate. And so I'll summarize with just a couple of very simple points. First is that the cellular source of fibrosis and many of the key mediators are well established in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Uh, that's been a hard-won battle, but we feel conclusively that in the case of NASH, the hepatic stellate cell is critical. Um, and many, but not all, pathways of tissue fibrosis are shared across organs. You'll hear from Dr. Vaughn about pathways in heart. Uh, that may be more important in that tissue than in liver. And so part of our challenge collectively is to stratify or uh, establish a hierarchy of the importance of different pathways that are either shared or tissue-specific. And finally, the frame framework of stellate cell activation provides many, but not all, targets for antifibrotic therapies, as some may be focused on hepatocytes, others on inflammatory cells. Um, what's been remarkable, however, is the liver's inherent capacity to regress scar even when fibrosis is advanced or even when cirrhosis is present. These may be reversible. And finally, I want to acknowledge my uh, outstanding lab team who are highlighted here on the left as well as a whole host of collaborators both within my institution uh, and, and outside institutions and uh, longstanding uh, durable funding from a number of federal agencies, including NIDDK, NCI, as well as the Department of Defense. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Friedman. Um, our next speaker for this webinar is Dr. Douglas Vaughan. Uh, Dr. Vaughan is the Irving S. Cutter Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. As a principal clinical investigator, Dr. Vaughan's work ranges from the bench to the bedside. His efforts and findings in vascular biology include basic investigations into the regulation of gene expression, genetic models of disease, mechanistic studies in humans, and clinical trials. His primary research interests are in the mammalian plasminogen activator system and the role it plays in cardiovascular disease and physiological aging. Uh, thank you very much for being on the line with us today, Dr. Vaughan. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm delighted to join in this webinar and continue this conversation about uh, fibrosis. Uh, in the context of what we heard, uh, there's, there's not really an epidemic of uh, cardiac fibrosis as there is in the liver-related uh, TANASH, but there is a, there's been a really important change uh, 
in the cardiac world and our ability to detect uh, cardiac fibrosis because of the widespread use of cardiac MRI over the last uh, several years. That allows us to non-invasively detect scar in the heart. It turns out that, that the heart has a very limited repertoire of responses to injury. Uh, there's very little regenerative potential in the mammalian heart. And, and almost every model of injury, whether it's a genetic model of, uh, of injury in the heart related to a mutation in a contractile apparatus, to uh, myocarditis, to ischemic injury, in many of those circumstances, one can see scar develop. Now, scar is important in the heart because it is an important functional contributor to the development of congestive heart failure. So heart failure is the leading health care expenditure in the United States. In the last several years, we've seen a dramatic shift in the, uh, in, the in the presentation of patients with heart failure. We see more and more people presenting with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And in that situation, SCAR is certainly an important contributor to the dysfunctionality that occurs in those uh, patients in, in that setting. Cardiac fibrosis is identified and contributes to heart failure in multiple forms of cardiac disease, as I already mentioned. There are severe clinical sequelae of cardiac fibrosis. There, there are increased filling pressures, uh, increased ventricular stiffness, alterations in, in ventricular structure and function and remodeling, and, it, and SCAR can be pro-arrhythmogenic. Uh, the degree of delayed gadolinium enhancement correlates with the, the, the uh, extent of of scar formation or fibrosis in the heart, and it correlates with prognosis. And as I already mentioned, the degree of uh, cardiac fibrosis uh, correlates with the development of congestive heart failure. Now, my laboratory has come at this from a uh, really a different sort of uh, prism than we heard about with uh, in the Nash story just a moment ago uh, from Dr. Friedman. The uh, my lab has worked on the plasminogen activator system for almost 30 years. This is one of the endogenous systems that prevents or uh, uh, that prevents intravascular clotting. This system is also involved in um, extracellular housekeeping, if you will. Uh, plasmin is a voracious protease that, that can degrade fibrin clots, but it also can contribute to the direct and indirect clearance of scar or uh, scar-like materials in tissues. Uh, we have really focused on the role of plasminogen activator inhibitor type 1, or PI-1 for short, in the regulation of the mammalian plasminogen activator system. And much to our surprise, we found that a deficiency, a complete deficiency of PI-1 is associated with, with cardiac-specific and age-dependent uh, fibrosis. Now, that, that's very, that's, that should be a surprise to the listeners on the webinar today, because in general, uh, deficiency of PI-1, whether genetic or pharmacological inhibition of PI-1, has been reported to diminish fibrosis in experimental models of kidney disease, liver disease, and lung disease. It turns out that, that uh, in the heart, there's a very specific cardiac fibrotic phenotype that, development, that develops in mice that are homozygous for PI-1 deficiency. Now, we discovered this uh, several years ago, and this was also reported by laboratories at the University of Washington, University of Washington in Seattle and also at, at Notre Dame. It turns out that PI-1 deficient mice, if you uh, allow them to live long enough, they will develop really malignant scar and fibrosis in their myocardium. It's present by the time they're 12 months of age. It's widespread by the time that they are 24 months of age. And you can see the extent of fibrosis that we measured in the hearts from these knockout mice uh, that is time-dependent. Now, interestingly, we, we never see this in mice that are, have a partial deficiency of PI-1, but we see it consistently and reproducibly in mice that have a complete deficiency of PI-1. Now, that, might be, that's a, that could be an experimental curiosity or have no relevance to... Uh, human disease, but hopefully I can convince you that that is not necessarily true. Uh, over the last uh, few years, we've had the exquisite opportunity 
to begin to uh, investigate the effects of PI-1 deficiency in human beings. Uh, Amy Shapiro and her colleagues at the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center uh, described PI-1 deficiency in a in a uh, extended kindred of old order Amish that originally immigrated to Indiana from Switzerland in the mid 1800s. The original program pro proband was described in an article in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1992, and she had a unique and distinct distinctive bleeding disorder. Across this extended kindred in eastern Indiana, there are at least 11 individuals with complete PI-1 deficiency. There are probably up to 2,000 individuals with partial PI-1 deficiency. But the, it turns out that we've had an opportunity recently to do cardiac MRIs on a few of these individuals with complete PI-1 deficiency, and we brought them to Chicago to complete these studies, and you can see in this slide, we see extensive epicardial cardiac fibrosis in human cardiac uh, uh, imaging uh, from two of these uh, Amish individuals with complete PI-1 deficiency. So here's an, a model of a, of a fibrotic cardiopathy, if you will. They don't have a functional abnormality. They don't have a myosin or, or a contractile appar apparatus uh, mutation but they develop cardiac fibrosis, and it's, it's present at least in the first few individuals that we've imaged, and we're in the process of completing imaging on all the available adult uh, homozygous individuals at this point in time. So we've got a model of cardiac fibrosis, spontaneous cardiac fibrosis, that's present in mice and in men. And we're, we're trying to unravel this and try to determine if this really has relevance to the larger problem of cardiac fibrosis in, in the clinical world. Uh, we've done a variety of different things to try to get to the mechanistic base of this uh, fibrosis. For example, we've done uh, detailed RNA-seq in cardiac tissue from PI-1 deficient animals and compared it to uh, cardiac tissue from wild-type animals both on a, on a genetic basis and a time-dependent basis, we certainly see that there are, there's a dramatic spectrum in the alteration of genes expressed in PI-1 deficient uh, cardiac tissue compared to uh, wild-type tissue. Furthermore, if we simply uh, administer agents that that generally can promote cardiac fibrosis, we've been able to, we've been able to recognize the fact that the, the de deficiency of PI-1 predisposes or accelerates the mice to the development of cardiac fibrosis after exposure to angiotensin II. Now, this gives us a model to be able to test our hypothesis that doesn't require a year or two years for the phenotype to develop. As you can see in this, in the uh, photomicrographs, uh, shown on this slide, if we look at uh, PI-1 uh, deficient animals, uh, they develop about a, a fibrotic index of 17% compared to 5% in wild-type animals, and they also show a reduction in ejection fraction very rapidly after exposure to angiotensin II. And this model allows us to be able to test specific hypotheses related to what's driving the fibrotic phenotype in the hearts of these animals. One of the, one of the more interesting uh, insights that we've developed in the last few years is related to the um, expression of TGF-beta in the heart in animals as the fibrotic phenotype uh, develops. Now, we, we're all aware that TGF-beta has been implicated in fibrotic phenotypes in a variety of different tissues, including the kidney, the liver, as we just heard, and certainly the lung as well. But when we look at the expression of uh, TGF-beta in cardiac tissue in mice exposed to angiotensin II, we find really for the first time that TGF-beta is actually expressed in the myocardium, and its expression is enhanced in the animals that are PI-1 deficient. This speaks to the possibility that PI-1 is a regulatory molecule inside cardiomyocytes that regulates TGF-beta expression. 
TGF-beta in turn has the capacity as a cytokine to act on local tissues and particularly on fibroblasts to pr promote to promote a fibrotic phenotype or a, a fibrotic program. Now, we, when we do the converse and we say, well, okay, deficiency of PI-1 promotes the expression of PI-1 uh, of TGF-beta in cardiomyocytes. What happens if you overexpress PI-1? In cardiomyocytes, and here in this slide, we've done just that. We've uh, we've transfected uh, cardiac cells with uh, with a PI1 expressing gene, and we find that uh, under circumstances where the PI1 is expressed, the amount of TGF TGF beta that's expressed in those cardiomyocytes goes down, as you can see in the lower panel of Western blots. So there's a direct feedback loop between PI1 and TGF beta. And the, the traditional way of thinking about that interaction is that TGF beta drives PI1. Well, it turns out that these cardiomyocytes are telling us that PI1 actually reg regulates TGF beta, and there's a reciprocal loop between these two important factors that contribute to the fibrotic phenotype. Now, we've, uh, we've had the opportunity to uh, make iPSCs and uh, generate cardiomyocytes that are deficient in PI-1. We've used this uh, in vitro model to uh, advance our understanding of other genes that are, or other factors that might be involved in the fibronic phenotype that we see in PI-1 deficient mice and men. As you can see in the, uh, in the, in the uh, photograph micrographs on the left, the cardiomyocytes themselves don't look really much different between uh, wild-type cardiomyocytes and uh, PI-1 deficient cardiomyocytes. But there are a number of different genes that are differentially regulated in response to angiotensin II and to uh, uh, and to stress, and these and many of these may be important contributors to the fibrotic phenotype. On, on a more broad, in a more broad uh, perspective or a broader perspective, we find that PI1 regulates a number of different angi early angiotensin II mediated cardiac hypertrophy and transcri transcriptional events. We can find that, that uh, uh, when we treat animals with angiotensin II, we can find specific, a specific gene pattern that's altered by the, by the, uh, uh, the absence of PI-1. And again, this gives us uh, some important leads into factors that may actually contribute to the fibrotic phenotype in, in mammals. So is, cardiac, is cardiomyocyte TGF-beta a pharmacologic target in preventing fibrosis? Um, can we indir or can we indirectly antagonize TGF-beta? Certainly direct antagonism of TGF-beta has been tried in a number of different experimental and clinical circumstances. There are effects on immunity and cardiac function that have, been, that have limited, limited the enthusiasm for this sort of approach. Uh, so let's think about another possibility. Um, BMP7 is an intracellular factor that, that serves as a negative regulator of TGF-beta signaling in, uh, in the cells. So here we've done an experiment where we've uh, uh, taken PI-1 deficient mice, uh, treated them with angiotensin II, and either simultaneously administered vehicle or BMP7. And we're looking at the extent of fibrosis and the ejection fraction. And we can see by, by simultaneously administering BMP7 with angiotensin II in these PI-1 deficient animals, we, we significantly remo reduced the amount of fibrosis generated, and we preserved the ventricular function over the period of the experiment. So our proposed model starts to look something like this. And, and this, is, uh, this is simplified, and there are obviously lots of other factors that are involved. But if you think about the cardiomyocyte as being the driver of cardiac fibrosis itself, it starts to change your perspective on, your, on the understanding and the approach to cardiac fibrosis and to congestive heart failure. So if PI-1 actually regulates TGF-beta, which we've shown in experimental models, both in vitro and in vivo, we can think about uh, deriving or applying factors that actually influence the activity of cardiomyocyte TGF-beta, and by doing so, 
limit the amount of fibrosis. You know, as as uh, we heard earlier the, this morning, uh, there's really no good uh, treatment for hepatic fibrosis at, at this point in time. There's really no good treatment for the uh, for the reversal of cardiac fibrosis either. We have a lot of drugs that that treat heart failure broadly, but none of them directly address the fibrotic problem. Uh, there are certainly drugs in the developmental stage at this point in time that that might be interesting, but it would be uh, you know based on what we've observed in in this very distinct genetic model of cardiac fibrosis, it might be useful to think about targeted uh, inhibition or alteration of TGF beta related signaling in the cardiomyocyte as a way of either limiting or even even perhaps reversing uh, cardiac fibrosis. So in summary, I want to. There are a few points I'd like to make, and then we'll wrap this up. I think uh, first, uh, otherwise healthy human beings with a complete plasminogen act, PI1 deficiency exhibit exhibit uh, spontaneous cardiac fibrosis, and PI1 deficient mice develop accelerated fibrotic cardi cardiomyopathy after cardiac injury. Uh, we've defined a novel upstream regulatory mechanism for PI1 in transforming growth factor beta-related or mediated cardiac selective fibrogenesis. We've also provided direct evidence that cardiomyocytes are so a source of TGF beta, and that's sort of uh, uh, heretical in some in some perspectives. And um, cardiomyocyte PI1 expression modulates TGF beta and provides a feedback inhibition of early autocrine signaling of that of that loop. And furthermore, PI1 deficiency is associated with, with reduced cardiac levels of the inhibitory SMAD6, and pharmacological treatment with BMP7 ameliorates cardiac-mediated fibrosis and cardiomyocyte TGF-beta autocrine stimulation. So although PI1 deficiency is generally uh, quite rare in the, in the human condition, we think that this very unique model, genetic model of cardiac fibrosis may provide important insights into the prevention and treatment of cardiac fibrosis broadly as it impacts uh, uh, humans in a variety of different clinical uh, scenarios. I need to acknowledge my many uh, collaborators and partners in this work over the last several years, particularly uh, Pete Flavarius, who, who did a lot of the work recently in un unraveling the role of cardiac TGF beta in contributing to uh, cardiac fibrosis. You know our partners in Indiana that have introduced us to the uh, the uh, Indiana uh, Swiss Amish community and allowed us to begin to study the relationship between PI1 and cardiac fibrosis in those uh, homozygous individuals, and uh, the rest of my laboratory group over the over the last uh, many years as, we, as we've tried to unravel this uh, this mysterious form of cardiac specific fibrosis. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Vaughan. Um, a really great presentation, and uh, thank you also, Dr. F uh, Friedman, for um, your input and your presentation. Um, it's uh, now time to take some questions submitted by our online viewers. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you're watching us live, you can still submit your questions <coughs> by clicking the Ask a Question tab to the right, typing the question into the message box, and then clicking OK. Um, so we have about 15 minutes, which is fantastic because we have received a lot of questions uh, from our online audience. Um, so, Dr. Vaughan, I'm going to start with you. Um, a couple of questions about uh, TGF-beta. Um, this viewer asks if TGF-beta 1, 2, or 3 um, are the, the molecules involved, and also are other members of the TGF-beta superfamily possibly involved, uh, such as activins? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We've found that it's prim primarily TGF uh, beta one involved, and act we've certainly seen alterations in activin as well. We we see broadly uh, a, an increase in the TGF beta signaling pathway in PI one uh, deficient animals, and we think they're they're likely multiple targets, uh, and, and that we all uh, we all have an appreciation for the complexity of that system. Lots of different um, ligands, lots of different receptors. Lots of different components that attenuate or alter the activity of that system, but certainly that our our evidence, the evidence that we've unraveled so far in PI1 deficient mice uh, and in cardiomyocyte human cardiomyocytes, uh, suggest that there's a direct relationship with the TGF beta signaling pathway. Uh, 
And a, a follow-up question, we've actually had a couple of questions on this, and uh, Dr. Friedman, I'm going to come to you as well. Um, one of the questions asks, is PI-1 regulation of TGF beta unique to cardiac tissue or more generally true in other tissues? And so, Dr. Vaughan, if you could address that first. Yeah, that's a great question. We're, we're, uh, we're just beginning to scratch the surface on this. I, I want to point out that the, 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 uh, the, fibro the fibrotic phenotype that we see in PI-1 deficient mice is only present in the heart. We never see it in the liver. We never see it in the kidney. We never see it in the lung. It's a cardiac-specific uh, fibrotic phenotype, and that's where we see the specific alteration in the TGF-beta-related signaling. I would imagine if it was actually uh, relevant or active in those other organs, you would see fibrosis, but we don't. So I think it's it's really a, a cardiac-specific uh, phenomenon, uh, but we need to do more work to actually uh, validate that uh, that hypothesis. Yeah, and for, liver, for liver, sure. For liver, uh, there's been studies that actually suggest that PI-1 is protective in experimental models, but to my knowledge, there's been no human studies and no human therapeutics that have been developed based on those observations. So I think uh, Dr. Vaughn is certainly correct that um, the phenotype that he's describing has never been described in liver, to my knowledge. Um, and I think this may be a very good example of how the same molecules may be regulated in a tissue-specific manner. An even better example are the different roles of integrins in tissue fibrosis across tissues, where integrins are certainly uh, tissue and maybe even disease-specific, and that has implications for which ones and how to antagonize them in different states of tissue fibrosis. There's another uh, aspect of this that d deserves some uh, discussion today, too. So PI-1 is, um, is elevated in individuals with the metabolic syndrome. Uh, PI-1 is a, uh, it predicts the development of, uh, of uh, fatty liver in, in mice and in, in human beings. Uh, certainly uh, PI-1 deficiency or PI-1 inhibition has been shown to, pre to prevent uh, steatohepatitic uh, or, or the, the, uh, de the accumulation of fat in the liver in experimental models. Uh, so one would think that there is a role for PI-1 in PI-1 deficiency actually in protecting against fatty liver and potentially against uh, fatty liver related fibrosis. Agree. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Dr. Vaughan. Um, Dr. Friedman, uh, let me come back to you. Um, what diagnostic biomarkers relating to fibrosis in Nash? Um, and the heart are being tested. Um, are they useful in the inflammatory phase before fibrosis develops? And are any useful as treatment response uh, biomarkers? Right. Well, that's a great question. I'll defer the heart biomarkers to Dr. Vaughn. Uh, the challenge for us from a clinical and clinical trial perspective is currently any drug that's entering phase 2B or phase 3 trials for NASH fibrosis needs to be uh, paired with liver biopsy. Uh, nonetheless, there's an intense effort to develop biomarkers that will uh, predict disease outcomes and, in particular, that are um, related to specific targets. There are no, there are no approved biomarkers uh, that can supplant biopsy for registrational trials, number one. And number two, there are no specific uh, companion biomarkers that are being used uh, that are target-specific for a particular drug. There are some companies that have described microRNA profiles that seem to track with response to their drug, uh, but it's unclear whether that's unique to their target and, and locus of action for the drug. Some of the non-invasive imaging that are being developed include um, tests that measure liver function, interestingly enough, which is not really imaging per se, but measuring the latent reserve, functional reserve of the liver. Um, MR technologies are advancing very rapidly. There's both uh, MR elastography as well as uh, a uh, corrected T1-weighted imaging technology that can uh, develop an aggregate liver inflammation and fibrosis score. Uh, there are also other tests that measure the proteolytic activity in a, in a comprehensive way in patients with NASH to see if they are either elevated in advanced disease or uh, reflect a response to therapy, but none of them really have reached the point where they're FDA-approved uh, 
um, even though they show some promise and <coughs> for which there's really an urgent need to get away from biopsy. One, one other Great point time. is that uh, okay. just one other point is that. Uh, while there are robust diagnostic markers for fat content, for example, MR fat fraction, um, those tests, that test in particular, is useful primarily as an early uh, biomarker to determine if liver fat is being reduced by a drug of interest. And so it can be of some benefit in phase 2A trials where the mechanism of action of the drug is to reduce liver fat, and the MR fat fraction will help. Um, establish uh, reduction in fat, but it's not a it's not a biomarker that will be sufficient for drug approval. And Dr. Vaughn, yeah. could you talk to um, yeah, biomarkers with, in with, heart? Yeah, with respect to uh, cardiac fibrosis, I'm I'm not aware of a really a validated biomarker that reflects the extent or the presence of cardiac fibrosis. Uh, certainly, cardiac MRI with a with the uh, gadolinium in imaging is the uh, gold standard for the identification of fibrosis in the heart. And as I said earlier, uh, it has important prog prognostic uh, implications in individuals with familial cardiomyopathies and particular with uh, mutations in the contractile apparatus. Now, there are, uh, there are developing ways or methods that might uh, actually give us some insights into development of of heart failure or uh, or even uh, uh, hepatic fibrosis or fatty liver in the future. There was a very interesting article just published by Horvath's group at UCLA. There's, they are statistical epidemiologists, and they've been interested in epigenetic changes that, that predict aging and aging-related illnesses. And I, I would invite the the listeners today to take a look at that article. It really is rather breathtaking. And they they took a, a they look they took a variety of biomarkers that that sort of reflect aging, if you will, a, including PI one. And they they uh, they actually uh, collected and uh, generated uh, methylation uh, DNA methylation patterns that correlated with plasma levels of the, these biomarkers. For example, there's a, a, a genomic methylation pattern that predicts your plasma PI-1 level. And using that mDNA pattern for PI-1, they found it to be the best predictor for the development of fatty liver in four different databases involving thousands of patients of all different ethnicities. The mPI-1 also predicted the development of heart failure. Uh, so there are there are emerging opportunities for diagnostics related to not just biomarkers that uh, that are present in uh, plasma, but also in circulating uh, blood cells in plasma that reflect an epigenetic change that might actually alert you to the potential of future susceptibility to a variety of aging-related illnesses, including heart failure or hepatic fibrosis. Yeah, I'm going to shift gears slightly and come to each of you with a, a quick question on biomechanics. Um, so firstly, uh, Dr. Friedman, to you, um, to what extent is hepatocyte function linked to structural abnormalities in liver fibrosis? Um, uh, does the excess collagen stiffness and change in architecture directly impair hepatocyte function, or um, are the functional and structural changes parallel but separate processes? Uh, very thoughtful question. So I, both are true, uh, honestly. Uh, so uh, uh, let me just step back and say that one of the cardinal features of liver and heart, I guess, as well, is that as fibrosis progresses, the liver becomes stiffer. That's the basis in simple terms for both a bedside test known as transient elastography as well as MR elastography, which effectively is just measuring the stiffness of the tissue uh, non-invasively. And stiffness has a number of different consequences biologically through through specific transduction mechanisms. For hepatocytes, um, stiffness can actually increase proliferative activity, at least in experimental models and cell culture. So, uh, and stiffness is also associated clinically with a rising uh, risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Of course, in the context of all the other changes that are occurring with chronic liver disease, stiffness will also activate stellate cells. So, at the same time, a a, uh, a dysregulated or abnormal microenvironment conferred by 
fibrillar collagens and other and, and other glyco, matrix glycoprotein creates um, a, a physical uh, stimulus to dedifferentiation of hepatocytes, loss of differentiated, differentiated function, at the same time as it's further promoting fibrosis, so it's a feed-forward cycle through activation of stellate cells. And Dr. Vaughan, a, a similar question for you, I guess, uh, that asks, to what extent is the changing biomechanical environment of fibrotic tissue acting as a feed-forward mechanism which couples matrix stiffening with adverse transcriptional pathways? Again, that's a very thoughtful question, and, and it, the question itself indicates that the, uh, that the individual sent the question and has some real insights into the unique uh, sort of physiology and, and pathophysiology that the mammalian heart uh, experiences. Uh, certainly, um, fi fibrosis has direct functional consequences on the heart, it alters when it alters uh, filling patterns. It also has direct hemodynamic consequences in terms of raising filling pressures. Those endure, those alterations induce a cycle of ventricular or cardiac cardiac remodeling that is deleterious over the long run, and that contributes to the progression and evolution of congestive heart failure in a variety of circumstances. Great. Thank you, Dr. Vaughan. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, Dr. Friedman, one for you. Uh, given the pathways you presented, do you think it's important for a potential NASH therapeutic to show fibrosis reversal uh, or NASH resolution? And what does that mean for the current agents being investigated, uh, especially given yesterday's announcement of uh, top-line data for uh, the new drug uh, OCA? Right. So I'm clearly a sophisticated uh, listener. The um if you recall the, the graph that I showed you, in the end, what causes complications of liver disease is fibrosis. Um, and, of course, the most direct way to assure therapeutic benefit is to show a, an improvement in fibrosis in the context of a clinical trial or clinical usage. Nonetheless, uh, NASH resolution has also emerged as an adequate uh, alternative endpoint in clinical trials because we assume, and frankly based on strong clinical and preclinical data, that if you completely resolve NASH, then the drive to generate more fibrosis will be attenuated. And so uh, the FDA has, uh, has accepted either of those endpoints as a suitable one for clinical trials, such as the intercept trial that was alluded to in the question. Um, ultimately, though, even if it's NASH resolution, it needs to translate over the long run into a reduction in fibrosis, either regression or prevention of progression to cirrhosis. And uh, Dr. Vaughan, for you, um, obviously the race to the clinic is quite intense. Um, what therapeutic strategy or combination of strategies do you think is likely to be the most effective or successful? Oh, that's a that's a terrific question. I, I think that you know the the reality is that um, you know heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a, an enormous uh, uh, clinical problem. Uh, we have very limited drugs to be able to manage that and manage that problem, and most of them are sort of symptomatically uh, directed. Uh, we don't really have a therapy that actually targets the fibrotic phenotype or uh, specifically addresses the alterations in in, in uh, cardiac filling that occur with with uh, after injury or with aging, and uh, certainly as we uh, as we uh, as drugs are developed, fortunately we have the ability to detect changes in ventricular filling patterns that might reflect an alteration in fibrosis. We have the ability to quantify the amount of fibrosis non-invasively as well using using cardiac MRI. So as you know, as a variety of different drugs are developed to potentially address this enormous um, issue with regard to population health, we'll be able to uh, measure measure it directly. And uh, Dr. Friedman, do you have any thoughts uh, from the the liver side on therapeutic strategies? Uh, I think it's really too early to uh, assert definitively what drug or drug combinations will work. What I will say is that it's, number one, a very rapidly moving field. Number two, um, there is clear evidence, particularly based on a trial that was reported by Intercept, as well as phase two trials from other companies, 
that uh, you can move the needle in this disease. Uh, the challenge is to capture benefit in 100% of patients on a particular drug, which is nowhere near what we can accomplish now, and to find out if there are unique combinations that are, represent a sort of a Achilles heel for the progression of disease. We have no hierarchy of disease causality or the importance of one target versus another, and so the first generation of combination therapies are simply combining two different mechanisms of action, typically by the same company. Uh, we need to move past that to a more rational approach where we can define combinations that are uh, going to capture considerable benefit in more patients. But the good news is we can move the needle now, and uh, that's a very promising start to developing drugs for NASH. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I wish we had more time. Uh, there's still a lot of questions we haven't answered, but uh, we're going to unfortunately have to end things here for today. Um, so it just remains for me to thank today's speakers, uh, Dr. Scott Friedman from Mount Sinai Hospital uh, and Dr. Douglas Vaughan from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Um, please go to the URL at the bottom of your slide viewer uh, to learn more about resources related to today's discussion, and do look out for more webinars from Science available at webinar.sciencemag.org. This particular webinar will be made available to view again as an on-demand presentation within approximately 48 hours from now. If you'd like to receive alerts about future webinars, please go to the sign-up link in the Resources tab to the right of the slide window. We're interested to know what you thought of today's webinar. Please uh, feel free to send us an email at the address that is now up in your slide viewer, webinar at AAAS.org. Uh, again, thank you so much to our panel and to Cell Signaling Technology for their kind sponsorship of today's educational seminar. Goodbye.